Man, have I got a treat for you today. Today in this video, we are going behind the scenes at St Paul's Cathedral, one of London's most iconic buildings. We're gonna talk about the design, how ingenious it is, as well as some of the sneaky details to look out for on your next visit. This is part two because I already talked about some of the history that you can spot outside the cathedral in this video here. So if you want to watch that first, do go ahead. But otherwise, my name's Katie. I'm a qualified Blue Badge London tourist guide and the founder of Look Up London, which runs private tours and public walks across the capital. It started as a blog and every week I send a new London history blog about hidden gems and sneaky details straight to your inbox. So if you want to sign up for that, the link is below and these videos come out every other Tuesday. So St Paul's Cathedral. Now there's been quite a few churches on this site. The first was founded in 604 AD, but the one that we see today was finished around 1710, 1711. And it was designed by Christopher Wren and he had around him a crack team of iron workers, craftsmen, carvers, stonemasons. And he needed these people because not only would he do St Paul's Cathedral, but also 51 other churches across London and other buildings, some of which we've talked about before, like the old Royal Naval College in Greenwich. So first we're gonna look at the genius behind the design. And to understand this, we need to look at the old St Paul's, the one that predated the one that we see today. And this was finished in the early 1300s and it lasted right up until the Great Fire of London, more on that later, in 1666. It was built in the Gothic style of architecture, everything pointing upwards. Amazingly, it was a hundred foot taller than the current cathedral today, and this is partly thanks to the huge spire. The new St Paul's was going to be in the English Baroque style. So this is more classical and a style that Wren was heavily influenced by, and he wanted a mammoth dome to crown the top. But not everyone was keen on this dome. It was seen as a very Roman Catholic form of architecture and perhaps not suitable for this newly Protestant nation. So Wren had his work cut out for him. He had to spend a year creating what's now known as the Great Model. This was his way of showing people how spectacular his design with a dome was going to look. It was created by a man called William Clear, and it's at a scale of 1 to 25, made in the years 1673 to 4, and it cost about £600, which is as much as a good London house at the time. Now, just seeing the pictures, you can't truly appreciate the scale. Uh, so here I am. Yes, I am short, 4 foot 10, but hopefully this gives you an idea that this is massive. And it was designed to go inside as well. Christopher Wren even took the king, Charles II. Imagine them, these two men, standing in this intimate little place as Wren pitches his design to the king. But it didn't work. It was rejected. And this was the alternative. This is known as the warrant design. And you can see it's kind of a combination of dome and spire, quite a compromise. But Wren added a loophole. The king had stated that Wren could, with his liberty in the prosecution of his work, to make some variations, as from time to time he should see proper and leave the whole to his own management. He was essentially giving Wren control. As well as this team of craftsmen that Wren worked with, he was also closely working alongside Nicholas Hawksmoor. And we can see Hawksmoor's hand in some of the drawings, plans for the dome. In this one, dating from the 1690s, it shows how they were trying to figure out just how the dome was gonna stand. 
as ever, the problem is the weight. When we look at St Paul's today, the lantern, the dome and the drum surrounding it weighs 65,000 tonnes. That's more than the Titanic. So the solution? Three domes in one. Standing under the dome as you look up today, you can see these epic paintings by Sir James Thornhill. They feature the life of St Paul. And it's very fair to assume that you're looking at the underside of the dome, the one that you see from the outside, but you're not. Between the two is a brick cone and this distributes the weight. And you can get a really good look at this when you climb the 528 steps up to the Golden Gallery. Now this climb is not for the faint-hearted. It has spiral staircases and quite open with clear views down. In fact, if you do make it to the top, you can look through a tiny hole right at the top of the cathedral and look down on the floor below. Once you reach the top and you step outside onto the Golden Gallery, you're treated to some of the best 360 degree views over London. So now we've tackled the design of the current St Paul's Cathedral, what about any remnants of the older St Paul's? Along the Triforium level, there are stores of older stones from previous St Paul's cathedrals, and these were discovered around the area of the cathedral when it was being excavated and re really landscaped. But there's something older on the cathedral floor as well. This is the memorial of John Dunn, a poet and a former dean of St Paul's Cathedral. Now, he died in 1631, but the Great Fire of London, and hence the rebuilding of the cathedral, started in 1666. So this would have been found in the earlier St Paul's Cathedral. The memorial survived probably down to its torpedo-like shape as flames were surrounding and engulfing the cathedral, it's said that it powered through the floor, landing in the crypt, and then was later discovered in amongst the rubble. And this memorial was gonna become a really powerful symbol for another Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, Dean Matthews. Walter Matthews became Dean in 1934, and he would hold the post for 33 years. He was in charge during the so-called Second Great Fire, the worst night of the Blitz during the Second World War, on the 29th of December, 1940. This is the famous photograph, taken from Fleet Street by Herbert Mason that night, and I'm often asked on tours, how on earth did St Paul's Cathedral survive? The answer is inside the cathedral. If you look on the floor, there is a memorial to the fire watch. These are men and women who throughout the 57 consecutive nights of bombing slept in the cathedral. They kept watch on the roof and they put out fires protecting the building. Dean Walter Matthews later recalls how he actually slept alongside the statue of John Donne believing that if it had survived one great fire, it could survive another. So now let's look at some of the other hidden gems and details. If you book onto the Triforium tour or visit with a Blue Badge guide, you have the chance of seeing one of the best staircases in London. This is the geometric staircase. The 88 stones appear to float. There's no central support. In fact, the steps are embedded just four inches into the walls, but otherwise each step supports the one ahead of it, and it leads up to the library. Currently, the library is being extensively refurbished, but this room, amazingly, is untouched since 1710. It has the original floor, original carvings and shelving, and the cases are arranged quite sensibly, larger books on the bottom, with smaller on the top. But today, some of the most striking details in the cathedral aren't actually part of Wren's design at all. I'm talking about the mosaics. The mosaics were installed in the late 19th century, supposedly because Queen Victoria complained of how dark and dreary the interior of St Paul's was looking. 
Now, before you think this is outrageous, she did have a point. Just by the far west side of the church, you can see a surviving section of truly grubby wall. It's been blackened over years of coal smoke, and this was all before an extensive cleaning that took place for the 300th anniversary of the cathedral, costing £40 million. But back at the east end, at the Triforium level, we can peer over the choir and get a really good close look at these extraordinary mosaics. They depict the creation. We see Adam naming animals and beautiful details of so much flora and fauna. When you look really closely, you can truly see how coarse and rugged these mosaics are. The different angles that the stones are placed in mean that they reflect the light and literally glitter. And this is where you'll find the high altar. And it might surprise you that this is actually really new. This was the one section that was badly damaged during bombing in the Second World War, and so it dates from the 1950s based on an original design from Christopher Wren. Today it's known as the American Memorial Chapel and it commemorates the lives of 28,000 Americans and Canadians who were living in the UK and who died during the Second World War. You can spot some US links within the Memorial Chapel. The states are represented in the stained glass and in the iron railings, you'll notice 1666 relating to the Great Fire of London, but then also 1776. Nothing to do with St Paul's Cathedral, but everything to do with American independence. The last very sneaky detail to remind you of how new this space is, is a rocket ship. Hidden in amongst the wooden carvings, you can see a very thin shape surmounted by an arch of stars. It's a reference to the race to get the first man into space. Now, St Paul's as London's cathedral is the final resting place of many military heroes, including Lord Nelson and the Duke of Wellington. And it's also where you can find the tomb of Sir Christopher Wren himself. Wren, who died in the ripe old age of 91, can be found in the crypt, and it surprises most visitors that his tomb is incredibly modest, just this black stone tablet on the floor. But if we look at the memorial stone above, it lets you in on the joke. The final two lines translate as, Reader, if you're looking for his monument, look around you. So I really hope you've enjoyed this behind the scenes look at St Paul's Cathedral. I've linked to the ways that you can book to visit St Paul's Cathedral in the description below and it's my great privilege as a Blue Badge Guide to be able to run private tours inside the cathedral as well. If you've visited before let me know in the comments, especially if you were brave enough to climb all the way to the top. And I will see you for more of London's hidden history next time.